Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. This is your host, Colin Cattell. By popular demand from the audience, I've managed to get Mike Beck back on the show, and this time for a three-part series that will be released over the next month to focus on the battery metals, lithium, cobalt, and nickel. This week, we're going, going to focus exclusively on lithium. Mike, welcome back to the program. Uh, Colin, thank you very much for having me back. A pleasure. Yeah, and before we jump in, you just got back from LME Week over in London. Any highlights on the week as it pertained to the battery metal space? Yes, I, I don't think I've ever seen quite a buzz, um, perhaps um, at the level um, that we witnessed this week. It, it reminded me of sort of the the start of the China-driven super cycle in uh, the early mid-2000s, but the the theme um, almost through the entirety of the conference um, was battery metals with a particular focus on cobalt, lithium, nickel, and copper. Um, and uh, lithium and cobalt in particular are have been sort of well established as an investment theme the last 9 to 12 months. And you need to look no further than the number of, of junior companies pursuing those two metals to to confirm that uh, but nickel was sort of the the new kid on the block and a recognition that um, all of these EV batteries are going to require a substantial quantity of nickel and and much more than the the market is currently delivering and uh, copper also is emerging as a as a story because um, um, for those that have that have looked at it in detail, the the average electric vehicle consumes about 80 kilograms more of copper than an internal combustion engine, and uh, that includes the copper that's going to be needed for the build build out of the grid. So, so yes, so the the entire week um, this week in London was really a buzz about battery metals and those four in particular. Great. Well, sitting there watching you present at the show a couple of weeks ago, I couldn't help but think that your mind works much like a steel trap for numbers and data. And once that number, those numbers and data get in your mind, they don't seem to slip. So I want to I want to talk to you today about the numbers and data pertaining to lithium. Investors know that amongst the battery metals, lithium was the first one to take off. And um, I guess some people are wondering, will the trend continue and what does the future hold for lithium? So, Mike, maybe starting with the demand picture as it pertains to EV adoption rates. Okay. Uh, well, we, we always in our sort of uh, supply demand outlook analysis start um, there because it's it's much it's the the best of all scenarios is to have a um demand driven story as a, as opposed to a supply constraint in the case of of lithium we we actually have this rare event where we both have um a very strong uh, in fact unprecedented demand driven story combined with a a severe supply constraint and I'll I'll talk about those elements um in turn so on the demand side the lithium market today is is give or take 200,000 uh, metric tons this is of lithium carbonate equivalent which is the principal material that is purchased by the cathode makers um which in turn is purchased by the battery makers which in turn is purchased by um in 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 this particular case uh, the electrical uh, the electric vehicle manufacturers so so um just to put that in perspective uh 200,000 tons is a relatively small um market volumetrically by uh, metal industry standards and is about 1% of the size of the copper market if you assume that um that EV penetration rates um, will be by 2025 on the order of 15%, which is sort of the consensus view at the moment is 15 to 
that's not a terribly ambitious assumption. That means that by 2025, one in seven passenger cars will be an electric vehicle. And you you dial in certain assumptions as to um, battery chemistry type and the amount of lithium that's required. So, for, for example, um, if you take a Tesla uh, Model S and the 70 kilowatt hour battery option, which is sort of at the low end of the range for the uh, Tesla S, that uh, unit needs 63 kilograms of lithium. So if you do this analysis sort of across a range of chemistries and across a range of both um, pure electric vehicles as well as hybrids, you um, come to a calculation that says the world is going to need something on the order of 800,000 tons a year of uh, lithium carbonate. That is four times uh, current market supply. And so that's that's kind of interesting uh, because... Um, that's almost an unprecedented um, amount of new supply that has to come into the market in a relatively short time frame. As somebody once commented, they, they had never seen such a demand profile except for maybe aluminum foil when it was introduced uh, in the early 1900s and, and the subsequent then 10x demand for uh, aluminum. So it's it's unprecedented um sort of demand profile um for for any metal and in this case it's um it's particularly interesting because the market is supply constrained by long lead times to bring in new supply um to bring on a new hard rock um lithium mine is uh, on the order if everything goes well and it rarely does 5 years if you instead are looking at brines, which is a higher quality and lower cost of lithium, then the the average time from start to first production is on the order of seven years. So so how the market is going to deliver uh, four times current market supply in the next um, eight years or seven years, because we're almost through 017, is... Um, is a is a head scratcher and um the the other thing that um st- strikes us as very interesting in in lithium is it unlike many other metals it has a high degree of price inelasticity so um c- at current uh lithium carbonate prices um they they translate to 1 to 2% of the fi- final vehicle sticker price so if if the cost goes up uh, four or five x, uh, then they'll move to maybe perhaps five percent of the vehicle sticker price. I.e., they're not going to to um, cause demand destruction, and um, and at the same time, there is no obvious substitute for lithium, uh, simply because it is the it is the metal that has the lightest, the combina- unique combination of, the, uh, uh, of being the lightest and having the highest uh, energy density. And these are two superlatives that are critical for for mobile um, uh, battery applications. Um, not only not only cars and buses, but also uh, laptops and cell phones. So we we in our um in our history of the metals um industry me i've been in this industry for 35 years as an investor uh, i have never seen such a perfect storm so our our strategy has been to get um as long the metal uh, as possible uh, because uh, with these sort of uh, drivers uh, there's no doubt that lithium prices are going um way higher than they are now, and um, things will become a lot more interesting as we move into 2018 and 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 various and sundry vehicle manufacturers start um, releasing their new product offerings into the marketplace, which will stimulate further uh, pressure on the supply chain, which is already very tight. Mike, further to your point about potential replacements for lithium batteries and to dispel that misconception, you've met with uh, several experts in the industry. 
and you you're of the opinion that at least for the next decade or more there's nothing available that's going to be able to supply the fleet of EV vehicles. Uh, that is correct. I I attended um a cathode um metals conference that Benchmark um put on about 3 weeks ago in Newport Beach, California. Um and um and and at the conference um were uh, most of the major cathode um manufacturers who who deal specifically with this issue of, of battery chemistry and uh, changes um they see coming down the future at the moment for the foreseeable future which means really the next 7 to 10 years there is no um viable substitute for lithium and so lithium ion batteries will be the mainstay uh, for the next decade of of applications that require the uh, combination of high energy density and light weight so what um, what the industry is is doing now is is trying to migrate the chemistry uh, still using a lithium ion um, basis um, to to using um, more nickel and um, and less cobalt um and um for two reasons for that one um they're concerned about um uh, supply uh, difficulties with cobalt and that's the subject of another talk but but also the cobalt really doesn't contribute to the battery performance it its main reason for being there is to mitigate uh, problems with uh, thermal instability so for this foreseeable future um the 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 work and the research in the battery um cathode chemistry um industry is uh, to develop um um chemistries that have higher component of nickel which gives you more energy storage and a lower component of cobalt and moving from where the industry now is with with sort of a 5 a 532 or 622 to an 811 that's eight parts nickel one part manganese one part cobalt to get better performance and um and uh lower cost uh, but there is no substitute uh, for the foreseeable future for lithium, simply because if you look at the periodic table, um, you 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 will note um, that it is a unique um, element that has this rather uh, interesting and important uh, set of characteristics, i.e., high energy density and and very light weight, which is critical for applications that require. Um, um both of those characteristics um so yes uh, we don't see um we don't see a change um in the foreseeable future and you can just see that with the announcements the last 6 months of of all of the companies in particular the chinese uh, companies um building gigafactories all of these gigafactories that have been announced for europe additional ones uh, for Asia and also for North America are all based on lithium ion chemistry. So lithium um, is not going away for the next decade and, and perhaps even um, beyond that. Detailed in the chart in your presentation you gave at the conference, you showed that 100% EV penetration would require 25 times the demand for lithium as opposed to today. And today we only have EV sales at 1%. Um, at the same time, Mike, lithium prices are up significantly the last few years, which begs the question, how much of that price appreciation is tied to the demand we've already seen, and how much of that is industry speculation about the future demand? I guess what I'm getting at here is, do you see significant price increases continuing? Yes, I, there's no doubt. And, and lithium is also interesting because it's one of the most reactive um, elements um known to mankind and um, as a consequence uh, you can't uh, you can't have um, financial uh, speculators uh, buy the material and put it in a warehouse because after 9 months or so um it starts to uh, react with 
the atmosphere and degrade and with the passage of um, a bit more time becomes um, worthless and has to be reprocessed. So um, unlike many other metals like the uranium um, boom uh, where financial uh, speculators came in, bought, and, and currently also with cobalt, have bought uh, physical material in anticipation that prices would rise and stuck it in a warehouse, that's really not an option for lithium um, carbonate. And um, so lithium prices have gone from where they historically traded, which is four to $6,000 a ton, to sort of at the moment eighteen to $20,000 a ton with some cargoes as recently as last week in in China trading for $28,000 a ton. And um, my, my view is that um, this is just the beginning because I think that the the supply chain is tight now. If you are a cathode maker or a battery maker or um, a manufacturer and you try to go out and source any sort of tonnage um, of lithium carbonate today for the next one, two, three years, there is no spare material around. And I think it will get really interesting as we roll into 2018 because starting 2018 um, is when a number of uh, vehicle manufacturers expect to roll out their new EV offerings. And, um, you know, you have announcements of late that uh, Volvo starting 2019 will be 100% electric or hybrid. Volkswagen uh, publicly announced that by 2025, they expect 20 to 30% of sales to be electric vehicles. So we have an electric vehicles at the moment are somewhere on the order of one to one and a half percent of the market, the real action is going to start next year. Where the lithium um, is going to come from to satisfy these um, these product offerings is a real head scratcher. And to me, given the scarcity today and the, the 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 view that things will become even tighter as we roll into next year, prices will go up. And the fact that uh, lithium is very price inelastic means that prices can go way up and and manufacturers will continue to buy particularly as there is no substitute and it is a small part of the final uh, product unit price so they can afford to pay whatever they have to pay to get the material and so so again i have not i i don't think i've ever seen a um a metal that has this this um combination of supply constrained because of lead times of five to seven years to bring on new supply, a demand growth profile of sort of 15% year on year, and this high degree of price inelasticity. And you put those three together and you have um, you have a perfect storm. Um, and it means only one thing, and that is as, as scarcity continues to bite, prices will go up and up and up. So you you want to be um, long for sure uh, lithium because um, there's going to be a lot of money uh, made by those that are long with lithium exposure, however they choose to get that exposure over the next three to five years. Mike, like most commodities, there are a few different ways to get exposure. Operating margins for producers are substantially up in the past few years, and that could continue, of course, if lithium prices move up more. Moving down to the developers and explorers, the process of putting a new lithium operation in production, you've stated, is not something that's easy. Broad strokes here, what level do investors look to for maximum exposure to lithium? I think those that... Um are not just interested in um, s sort of uh, playing one of the t the two large caps, those being um, SQM and Abemarle, uh, that have a bit more appetite uh, for risk and, and commensurate exposure to much higher returns. Um, you want to uh, look at, um, uh, particularly my, my preference actually are the are the brine producers because this is um, ultimately the the and brines represent about half of current world supply, but this is the higher quality, lower cost material. So, if you're coming into this market as an investor with a blank sort of canvas, then 
I, I think uh, all else being equal, you would prefer to position yourself with um, a feedstock source that represents the the lowest um, cost in the industry, which means brines. In in this case, and, and that's my preference, um, if I'm going to position myself um, in a metal, I'd rather position myself at the low end of the cost curve. And for me, um, there's uh, the most compelling sort of risk-reward opportunity is a company called LSC Lithium. The ticker is LSC. It was listed in in late January of this year with a $40 million IPO. This company is a is a real standout, uh, principally because it is um, it has amassed over the prior two years the largest um, lithium brine acreage position um, of anybody in Argentina. It has virtually um, as much acreage under its control as all of the other Argentine uh, brine um, uh, explorers and developers combined, and. My view is if you have an underlying conviction that the, the the price is going up, you want to get uh, the maximum leverage exposure to the metal. And the footprint of this company's resource is unprecedented. And arguably, they're the largest uh, private holder of lithium brine resources in the world. And as such, um, with a current market cap of, I think, something around $150 million, it, there's there's nowhere uh, but up as these lithium prices um, really start to ratchet as, as scarcity and panic sets in amongst the the battery makers as we roll into next year. So that that is my um, that is my pick LSE lithium. Um, I I think just because of the sheer size of its of its exposure to um, to lithium resource that it it will um, it will have the highest move for every uptick um, in the lithium price. Um, it should um, get a a a multiplier um, far in excess of its peer group, and that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for stuff that has it has has a real prospect. If if the thesis is right of going up. 10 to 20x, and um, if I'm not so right, that it doesn't have much downside. Um, so that that's my pick, LSE Lithium. And in the spirit of full disclosure, and thanks to knowing Mike Beck and his investment circles, we are positioned in LSE Lithium and happy to be. It's hard not to attain a significant level of confidence in this story with the case being made here. Mike, last question for you. There's not very many companies that actually produce lithium, and that brings into question for a company like LSC or another uh, lithium company in similar circles. How does a company like that obtain a, a buyout or a reach of production? What is the end game for a company like this as an investor? Look, I, I, I think LSC's um, uh, base plan is to march, and, and it's doing so uh, as as we talk, it's 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 key projects through uh, definitive feasibility study and then into production. But because I think as the size, uh, g- given the size of its resource, and I think as the panic starts to set in um, in the supply chain uh, next year, I think the cathode makers and maybe some of the um, end users, uh, the vehicle manufacturers um, will then start to, well, they're already starting to look upstream. And as they look upstream, the the, the fact that um, this company, LSC, has the largest uh, resource portfolio of lithium brine acreage uh, in Argentina and arguably in the world, uh, because the stuff in Bolivia is controlled by the government and, and the chemistry is wrong, which is why um, they don't produce, and and Chile has has uh, challenges um, with uh, water issues and regulatory issues. Uh, that kind of leaves Argentina on the brine front. It it will become, in my view, a potential take takeover target. So you look at one of the big um, battery makers, whether it's Panasonic, Panasonic or Ganfeng, and as material starts to um, increasingly become short. They're going to naturally look at um, ways that they can lock in long-term supply, and that that almost necessitates buying 
um, somebody with a big resource base um, like LSC. And and so uh, that would be a happy event if it's uh, the right price at the right time. Um, and if it's not, it's okay um, in my view because LSC will continue to march toward um, the first production of its key projects and it will do fine as a low-cost um, lithium brine producer. So either way, um, I think investors will be well rewarded. What can go wrong? Uh, there, really, there are only two things that can go wrong. Is it turns out that that the industry consensus is um, is off, and that electric vehicles don't take to the mass market. I I think the probability of that happening is is quite low because probably within three to five years, it's it's going to be cheaper to to own and operate an electric vehicle than an internal combustion engine, putting aside all the regulatory issues about lower emission standards, and the only way to get there is through electric vehicles. Um, so I, I, that that could go wrong, but highly unlikely. I think this trend is irreversible. Or there could be some um, perhaps uh, political um, um, disruption in Argentina, but even that, I think, is a manageable risk. If you look at FMC, which is the third largest lithium producer uh, from brines uh, in the world, they they have a mine, uh, a long-standing um, producing lithium brine mine that's been running for 15 plus years in Argentina, and so they've um, they very happily continue to produce and prosper through. Um, through a number of different regimes in in the country, so I, I think, uh, in in our view, um, those two um, possible things that could go wrong are 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 acceptable, um, modest uh, risks, and so they don't trouble us too much. Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. Excited as I am sure all our listeners are to record our second interview for next week on the second battery metal being cobalt. I do appreciate your time today and your thoughts on the lithium market. Uh, Colin, always a pleasure and look forward to chatting next week. Think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector junior mining sector are good people and kind people hit the bid how violent that term could be it actually could be quite violent uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally and the world is always going to need raw material it's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth totally destabilized hey hey troll did you hear what's going on in yemen